Hi, I'm Scott Magoon. I'm an author and illustrator of picture books and soon graphic novels. I live in Reading, Massachusetts, a town of about 25,000 people, 12 miles north of Boston, with my wife Christy and our two teenage sons. At the moment, we're in our town forest, a place I've enjoyed a great deal over the 15 years or so we've lived here. I grew up in New Hampshire and rural Maine. That instilled a real love for nature and the New England woods in me. Like so many of us, I want this to be here for my kids and all future generations. I'm greatly alarmed by climate change, frustrated by our apparent lack of progress in making change to combat it, and so I want in on this fight to help save the planet. What better place to start than with our young readers? They'll be on the front lines in this battle in the years ahead, and they should know what they're up against. That's the heart of what led me to write and illustrate The Extinct's Quest for the Unicorn Horn, my first graphic novel. I'd love to show you how I brought The Extinct's, a little book with a big mission, to life. So let's head back to the house in the studio. I can't wait to show you more. I'll drop my boys off at school first in the morning, then I'll come back home and make myself a nice cup of coffee. Maybe you'd like some too. I can pour you a little bit. And we're gonna head over into my sunroom. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I approach thinking about my books, writing them, illustrating them, and so on. Got your coffee here. Hope you enjoy that. Got mine. I like to come here in the mornings to start my day. It's got great light. It's a nice quiet spot for me to answer my emails. And uh, I also can look at proofs here as well. Uh, the light is really good to look at uh, color proofs and uh, make sure they're looking uh, like I want them to. It's also a good place to, to do a lot of writing. And before I start drawing or writing, I really want to have a strong concept in mind and I'll start to kind of collect my thoughts uh, in, in this room. Um, in writing these two books, it was critical for me that these, two, that these books are 100% character driven. I think that's why we read these stories. We just like to see uh, characters make their way through conflict and come out better for it at the end of it. My new book, uh, Quest for the Unicorn Horn, follows that. It tells the story of Scratch, a saber-toothed tiger in search of family. He is the stubbornly loyal leader of Roar, a team of de-extincted animals sent on environmental missions across the world the mysterious Dr. Z sends them to retrieve a mystical Siberian unicorn horn from thawing permafrost. They meet friends and more than a few enemies along the way. Well, after they discover they are the last of their kind, Scratch must accept that he's worthy of love or embrace the evil that threatens to tear them apart forever. Um, you know, some people have asked me, why, how did you decide to do a graphic novel? You've done so many picture books. Why do a graphic novel at this point? Why this format? Uh, I love comics, simply put. I always have. One of my earliest comic memories is sitting on my grandmother's lap as she read the Marvel Comics adaptation of Star Wars to me uh, aloud. Um, and as I got older, I started getting into comic books myself. I played the uh, Marvel superheroes role-playing game, like D&D, for only with Marvel characters. Um, and like many kids, I just started drawing comics uh, when I was very young. Um, I had a weekly comic strip at Northeastern University uh, for a couple years called Duct Tape Man. He was kind of uh, Spider-Man, only he used duct tape to capture crooks and bad guys and comment on the state of the university at the time, uh, or so I thought. <laughs> I drew it with a crow quill pen and uh, zipatone to get the grayscale of the duct tape camera ready. Uh, uh, this was before digital, of course. Uh, I also drew editorial cartoons for the school newspaper. And as an English major, I really enjoyed writing the scripts uh, for the for the strips uh, story arc. It was kind of a welding of my of some of my favorite things: writing and drawing. So I was really into comics uh, long before picture books, and I've so loved the return to it. It's really been a bit of a, of a homecoming. It's pretty cool. Gosh, there's so many influences on my work. Uh, Frank Miller, Klaus Janssen, uh, Jack Kirby, David Mazzucchelli, Mike McNola, uh, John Romita, Dave Sim, and of course, TV shows like Johnny Quest. Uh, those shows, gosh, those shows caught my imagination not only were there great stories, 
but because they felt the stories felt a little edgy and dangerous to me as a kid um, because you know, usually because the villain didn't survive the episode and it just felt like, oh my gosh, what's going on in this show? Way more edgy than anything I've been watching on TV at the time. I also appreciate the Johnny Quest shows because of their amazing sound design and uh, voice talent. <laughs> Uh, Thunderbirds. Four, three, two, one. Thunderbirds are go. Incredible marionette uh, puppets, sets, and vehicles. Um, they are just beautiful, uh, beautiful productions and just very clever uh, as, at how they solve some of the effects. Uh, check those out if you haven't seen them. I think they're on YouTube. Uh, and of course, movies like Indiana Jones, huge influence to the adventure, history, and humor. Uh, the settings are all aspects I, I strove towards in, in uh, making these books. But there are also um, real life sources too that inspire me. Um, Josh Gates and his Expedition Unknown show. In fact, it was that show where I first learned about the Badagaika pit and in Siberia and the harvesting of mammoth tusks found there. My own travels also inform the series as well. Um, the shark's tooth sword we see at the beginning of the book was actually inspired by a real life shark tooth sword I saw at uh, a museum, a history museum in Copenhagen. And the extinct's uh, headquarters, their hindquarters, HQ is inspired by Hammond Castle, uh, not far from here in Gloucester, Massachusetts. Uh, I like that place so much. I like the vibe it had for an eccentric creator like Dr. Z, but also it could house a team of extinct animals that is set apart. The, 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 they don't fit in anywhere else. So this was a, this, it just felt right. Um, so who are these characters anyway? Well, we've got, I told you about Scratch, uh, Sabertooth Tiger. Keto is a Collins poison frog. Lug is the woolly mammoth. And Marty, she's the passenger pigeon. Uh, most people I've talked to don't know that passenger pigeons are in fact extinct. And that was one reason why I had to include so much uh, back matter uh, about each creature and include a glossary. I'd love for readers to learn more about these extinct creatures and why they went extinct and how that connects to where we are today. Uh, so I'd love to show you more about how I brought all those creatures back to life. But for that, we should go up to the studio uh, grab your coffee, and uh, I'll meet you up there. Hi there. You found me. Great. Well, here I am in my studio. It's a small space. It's just an old converted um, bedroom that I've converted to office space. But it's got great light, and it's just it's nice and quiet. It's sort of in the back of the house. So uh, not a lot of distractions back here, uh, except for those that I've placed all around me which you can uh, start to see. I've got uh, a bookshelf here behind me. I try to keep all my books face out. I think they're more inspiring uh, visually to me that way. Here I've got a great uh, chair uh, for visitors and uh, I've got space to hang stuff from the walls here, as you can see. Um, I've also got these great uh, pieces of art that my boys made back in their art classes. Uh, that uh, demonstrate tints, tones, and shades. Then there's a color wheel here that my oldest son Owen did. Uh, the tints, tones, and shades uh, was done by my son Danny. Uh, over here I've got my record player and that is for all of the vinyl that you see here behind me. I started collecting jazz LPs back in uh, like about a year ago I guess, well Christmas time last year and I've loved it. It's been a nice distraction. It's been uh, something I can put on in the mornings and just uh, spin some records in here. It sounds awesome. And um, I just, I love jazz. Art Blakey once said, drummer Art Blakey once said that jazz clears away the dust of everyday life. I totally agree with that. And it keeps me inspired. It keeps me, it gets my energy going in the morning. So I like to have some of that playing as I work. Up here, you can see I've got, um, you know, just a mishmash of, of uh, stuff, colorful stuff that has inspired me. Uh, up there, I've got the um, old vintage G.I. Joe uh, mobile support unit vehicle that makes an appearance in Extincts. I've got my vintage Millennium Falcon and other various uh, items up there that uh, I like to look at. Uh, over here, I've got 
my computers that I work on, of course, my iMac and my Wacom tablet, uh, Wacom tablet, Cintiq uh, tablet. On my art farm, if, if you could consider for a moment uh, my studio as a farm, those kind of are my, uh, those are my tractors, my heavy duty uh, moving equipment for when I make art. And then my iPad on which I made the extincts, that's more of a car, um, if you will. What else have I got here? I've got uh, art drawers. I got you know tons of art supplies in there. All my mailing supplies in there, and it's so helpful to have it all here in one place. I've got my uh, runner's bib from the 2018 Boston Marathon here to always remind me uh, of that incredible experience around Rescue and Jessica, a life-changing friendship by Jessica Kensky and Patrick Downs, who, when they were here, signed my wall uh, over there, and uh, that's one of my favorite moments in the studio. So I have to show you that. Also, my friends Ryan Hagens and Matt Tavares, when they were here, uh, signed the wall too. I'd love to head over to my uh, desk here and show you a little bit more about the actual drawing of the book. So come on over here and uh, we'll do some of that. This is Scrivener. I write in this app. I do my research and store it in this app. I might keep uh, marketing ideas in this app. It's a central repository for everything Extincts related. Here in this corkboard view, uh, you can see sort of top down the structure of my story. I use the save the cat system when writing my manuscript. I won't go too much into that, but I highly recommend you checking out the save the cat books. Uh, there's a whole series now, uh, one about manuscripts, one about screenwriting. And that is what you're seeing here uh, in my, in my setup in, in uh, Scrivener. There's an anatomy of a page that I want to show you here. So we're going to jump ahead to page 120. Now, you'll see it's got this sort of gobbledygook here. It says page, uh, dollar sign. And what Scrivener does is uh, by using a comic page template, it will uh, look like this when you're working in it. But when you go to export it into a Word doc, it comes out looking really nice like this. Okay, and it automatically generates page numbers and panel numbers for you because it's been using these tags. I hope that makes sense. So it really lets you focus on your writing and less on whether or not you're labeling panels right correctly. Okay, really, really nice. It also, if you type in a character name, it will pre-enter your character's dialogue uh, name. So I've got obviously Scratch in here. I've got Ursa in here. So if I were to start typing, you know, instead L, it pre-guesses characters that I've already used. And you would just select one that you, uh, that you liked instead and assign that as that character's dialogue. Also, you'll see at the top, I try to include panel descriptions so that when I go to illustrate this scene, I'll know exactly what I meant to include in that scene. Try to be as detailed as I, as I can. I could do an entire video on Scrivener alone. It's wonderful. I can't recommend it enough. It runs on Macs. It runs on iOS devices. So if something comes to you while you're walking in the park, for example, and you have your phone with you, you can quickly open your Scrivener app and, and dash a little note off in your Scrivener app. All right, so we've got that in place. My whole manuscript ready to go. Let me show you the next steps as I bring this into Procreate. Procreate is an app that came out a couple of years ago. It's fairly new, but I've since come to love it a great deal. It's easy to use, it's inexpensive. It works really well with the Apple Pencil and the iPad Pro. It's fun to use. I can draw anywhere I go. I use this uh, easel. It's been really nice to have this easel. Uh, it gives me a whole open space that I can move my whole arm across the screen if I need to uh, need to get some more uh, motion in the art. All of those things together make for a really great and portable and versatile drawing system. Let's take a look at the app. I'd love to show you how I drew this sketch. I love this feature of Procreate. It's a time-lapse feature and it replays for you your entire drawing as you do it. So here we are working on this scene, I love this scene in the book. Uh, for those of you familiar with Save the Cat, this is the high tower surprise beat. Uh, the moment about 90% through the book when the characters are putting together their big final push and plan at the end of the story, like when the knight storms the castle, gets to the tower, 
when he's gonna rescue someone, gets there and, uh-oh, the door's locked. It seems the villain has won. Uh, so the characters really have to struggle to enact their big plan more than they thought they would. In Raiders of the Lost Ark, to use an example, it was the scene when uh, Indy gains a high ground with a bazooka and he holds Marion's captors at bay, threatening to destroy the Ark unless they release her. But Belloc knows Indiana Jones too well and calls his bluff, right? In this story, in the Extincts, Scratch and the team are on their way to capture the villain through a secret passage shortcut. But when they get there, they find the door is locked and what looks like a giant puzzle. It's an escape room. Uh, essentially, for those of you out there who have done escape rooms, I think the vibe of this will feel very familiar to you. With a limited number of pages with which to work, I want to see if this full, pred, full page spread will work. Uh, pure, it's purely, will this moment work within the confines of the limitations of my book? Can I fit everything in? The dialogue, an overview of the scene itself, and as it turns out, establish the puzzle they need to solve. Okay, we're gonna go into InDesign now where I'm gonna take that sketch that I was just working in Procreate and put into InDesign. And I'll show you more uh, when we get there. Here we go. Here we are in InDesign. It's just a page layout program. And um, this is my book trim here. And um, we're just gonna to start to, uh, we're gonna place that sketch that I showed you earlier from Procreate. So there it is. And you can see that it fits in here. It's looking good. I've got my gutter marked here at the center. So I can just tell that that's the center of the book. I've got rough panel one, panel two, and panel three here. So I'm going to go ahead and create some panels uh, just to kind of give me a rough idea of where the panels could go like this. We'll do one on here like this. And we'll draw another one over here like this. Now, a cool thing that InDesign has is something called styles, and that lets you instantly give objects in your document the same look. So I can go over to Object Styles. I've already created a style over here for panels. I'm going to make this one a fat panel. It's got thicker lines, and you can see it creates these nice uh, boxes all in the same style as this one here. Next, we need to copy and paste some text. So I'm going to go over to Scrivener. I'm going to grab this text right here. Go back to InDesign. And I'm just going to paste that in like this. OK. So now you can see I've got, let me zoom in a little bit. I've got some nice text placed here, but it's not the typography I want. So I'm going to go to Paragraph Styles. And this works the same way as the Object Styles. OK. So we're just going to assign basic dialogue to this. There we go. OK, so now we've got this nice typeface. That's the typeface we want. Here's like this. So now we've got our type placed. OK, and I know that's roughly where it goes because I've got a nice, nice rough sketch. Next, I'm going to create a word balloon just by selecting the oval shape. I'm going to go back to my styles. Remember, I got my styles. I got a style for my word balloon. So that's all ready to go. But it's blocked the text. So I can go here. I can go arrange, send to back. And that will let the text show through. I will also edit the text at this point. A couple breaks, text breaks. Like that. It's pretty rough. I mean, the idea is to give you a template on which you can start drawing the final art. Or a, or a second sketch, if you will, in, this, in the case of this spread. All right, so looks great. I'm not going to worry about uh, tails right now because it it's really just to get a sense of where the word balloon is going to go at this point and not where it's coming from. I have a rough sense that it's going to come from over here somewhere where Scratch is speaking this. What I, what I would do, though, I think, is um, move this up a little bit like this. There we go. So I'm going to repeat that over and over again for each word balloon until I get something that looks like I'll show you here in a sec. Okay, so once I repeat the process, I'm going to get something that looks like this. All right. And that is what I'm going to bring back into Procreate. I'm going to draw in something that looks like this in Procreate. All right, now we're going to go back into Procreate now and I'm going to work on a revised sketch there. 
Let's check it out. This spread is an outlier. For 99% of the pages in this book, I did just this stage uh, and then the final art stage. The previous version of this sketch was, as I mentioned, just to make sure everything was going to fit, was a more complicated spread based on all the things I needed to do in a limited space. Now, though, on this one, I'm refining what I've got with an eye towards where the disparate elements hit the page. If you look carefully, you'll see light gray guidelines. Uh, those are golden ratio guidelines, part of a template I used to make sure that important elements in my layouts hit at harmonious spots across the spread. For instance, you see lug fitting perfectly into like a little diamond shape guideline in the bottom left. And Marty the passenger pigeon in the upper right there, fl she's flying where several golden ratio lines converge at the upper right. I think that by following these guidelines, I wind up with more pleasing compositions more often than not. Uh, the, I don't want to get too deep in the weeds on the golden ratio. You can uh, look it up, Google it. It's really interesting. But some of the golden ratio patterns appear in nature, including in a arrangement of leaf, spiral arrangement of leaves and other plant parts. Some artists like Dali and Corbusier used their, the golden ratio in their works, uh, leaving it to be aesthetically pleasing. Apple uses it in their uh, iPhone icons. Uh, did following the golden ratio help balance my compositions? You be the judge. But uh, I'm pretty happy with how they turned out. Here's the moment we've all been waiting for. It's time to go to final art. One more time in Procreate. Check it out. Here we go. All right, we're going to start to refine the sketch line work here, making it a little more final looking. Even the smallest parts of the drawing I'm going to be zooming into and working on including Scratch here. You'll see I just flopped Scratch uh, so that he's facing the other way. That's sort of so I can see where the imperfections are, where I've messed up, so to speak, in my original drawing. Uh, if you've ever held up a drawing up to a mirror to see, you know, a drawing you've done up to a mirror to see where the mistakes are, it's the same idea. It's a challenge figuring out what to leave white, what to uh, paint with black, what to add with charcoal, and what to leave to color, and kind of working all that out. You get a sense for it as you work on the book more and more. Uh, as you go along. On the floor of this room there are keys engraved into the floor and, and each one has to be different because the puzzle uh, calls for it, the text calls for it. So it was a bit of a challenge making uh, the floor covered with keys. Each one has to be slightly differently and here I am drawing little details in on the key to make them just a little bit different from each other. Um, and then I'll take this grid, put it in perspective using the perspective skew tool. Then I'll start to color. There's only, gosh, there's only about six colors in this. White, light green, light blue, dark gray, blue, black, and brown. Um, the brown was the, the baton that Scratch has. Then there was the key change. Uh, I, look, I think it looked better to have the keys uh, vertically rather than horizontally. It helps sell the perspective of the room better. So I had to redo uh, the grid of the keys. Kept the key drawings, but just changed the perspective. And there it is, there's the final art. Well, that's all the time we've got today. I hope you enjoyed your visit to my studio. I so appreciate the chance to show you around and your watching. You can learn more about me, my books, and about the extincts, especially going forward at scottmagoon.com or goextincts.com. There you can find out more about extinct and endangered animals, a teacher's guide, behind the scenes stuff from the extincts, free downloads, and special extincts merchandise, the profits of which will benefit environmental causes. Enjoy the rest of your day. Me, I've got to get back to book two. It's nearly complete, and if all goes well, it'll be out in 2023. Until next time, thank you, and go extincts!